If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 22. We're going to talk about the river of life. And I don't know about you, but I love rivers. Okay? When we were young, we went camping. And uh, we would fish in rivers. Uh, uh, I remember one time uh, we were in uh, Colorado, no, New Mexico, around Taos. And we got woken up by a sound uh, out beside this river. And what they did, they had a big truck and they dumped all these fish about 50 yards from where we were and where we were camped. And man, I'm telling you, I had the best day of my life. <laughs> It didn't matter what you threw out. I was trying different stuff. There's some berries there. I tried that. They hit them. I had some Viennese sausages, you know, those things. Ooh, they taste good. They are good stuff. All right. Now, I don't like sardines, okay? I threw a piece of vine. Man, they'd hit that. I threw a leaf out one time. I am not kidding. And I hooked one in the back. All right. There was just so many there. And, and when you think of rivers, you think of life. You think of life. Uh, and today I want to talk about the river of life. The river of life. Number one, the perfect place. Heaven is the perfect place. Number two, the perfect light. The perfect light. God and Jesus are the perfect light. And then the perfect reminder. Right at the end of our text, he gives us another warning. And folks, he gives people another chance. He doesn't. Second Peter says he doesn't wish for any to perish, but all to come to salvation. But he doesn't make you accept him. He gives you the choice. And one more time uh, in this, he is saying, come. Three times in this scripture, he says, I come quickly. And we need to be on guard and we need to believe the words of God. So we see the perfect reminder. You know, the last chapter of Revelation contains the final description of heaven and the last words of Jesus Christ. It also contains the final challenge from our Savior who gave his life on the cross so mankind can be saved. It is a wonderful way to end the story of the greatest uh, book ever written called the Bible. These last two chapters have been uh, God reestablishing our final dwelling place. The overall theme of Revelation is Jesus is coming again, and we need to be ready for his return. It also reminds us of how important sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ is with others. For some, it could be eternally too late. And my heart breaks for people. And you think about it, folks, the gospel is everywhere. You can get online. You can look in, in, in books and in, 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 in the Bibles and the different translations. You can just see uh, Christian programs, so many on today, but yet there will still be those who do not accept Christ. Let's look at Revelation 22 to see how his story, capital H I S, Jesus' story is. Remember, everything in heaven will be perfect. So let's look at the perfect place. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And when we see heaven, folks, everything is pure, everything is holy, and everything is perfect. Here on earth, mankind has fallen. We have damaged the earth with uh, the things that we have done. And, and, you know, you can see erosion. You can see all kinds of things that mankind has done. But yet when we get to heaven, folks, it will be perfect. In the river of life, you know, you're looking at a clear crystal, clear crystal, proceeding from the throne of God. And when I study the Bible, I hope you do this, I try to get images in my mind. I try to picture what is going on in the Word of God. And you can see, number one, God's throne. It's going to be incredible, folks. That's where God is. That's where Jesus is in person. And this river is flowing out 
of the throne of God according to Scripture. And what that is, what that is talking about, the water life, is salvation. It is salvation. Hold your finger there and go to John chapter 4. John 4, Jesus gave us a hint of this in John chapter 4. He met the woman at the well. He sent them away. He sent his disciples away so that he could be one-on-one -on -one with this lady. He knew what time of day it was. Why? Not because he'd been following her, but he's Jesus. He knows everything. And she came to this well not knowing who she was going to meet, but I am telling you, it totally changed her life. And she was talking about physical water. She is talking about the water you drink. She's talking about the water in the well. And Jesus was sharing with her, I am the living water. I am the living water. Look at verse 13. And Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. And we know that is true. All right? I don't know about you, but every morning I wake up thirsty. I don't know why. It might have something to do with my diabetes or health or something. But, I, you know, I can't get enough water. And we as human beings, we have to have water. Our bodies is you know, made of water. And it says, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst again. But the water that I shall give him, we become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Oh, folks, the river, the river, the crystal clear water is flowing from the throne of God. It is per a perfect river. It is pure water. It is there for the Christians. We don't have to drink water there. We have to understand, and we knew from Revelation 21 that there is no more sea, no more water. We will have those glorified bodies, but everything we need, we will have in heaven. And it is a sign. This clear water is a sign of salvation. Now look at verse 2. And in the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And here we see the tree of life. And we knew in the uh, garden, garden of Eden, that that tree was not to be touched. But I'm telling you, the tree of life is speaking of abundant life. Abundant life. And Jesus spoke of abundant life. That there'll be waters and, and, and there'll be stuff. Folks, we, we will have no needs in heaven. There will be many, many blessings in heaven. It is just talking about, you know, the life, the tree of life in the fruit there. You know, it's not necessarily some thought it may be for eating, but I don't think so, folks. Uh, the tr uh, the tree uh, just represents, you know, again, life and the fruit is abundant life. And then it says, and there shall be no more curse. But the, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And when it says no more curse, Steve was uh, singing this to us. And folks, the curse is the curse of death. Death is all around us. When we turn on the news, uh, when we see reports, when we see, you know, every day there's murders in our country, and death is all around us. Folks, I am telling you, there is no more sickness and there is no more death. And you think about the healing of the nations, all right? Wars going on, okay? Wars going on. There's not going to be any of that in heaven. You talk about God just, just healing our hearts, folks. We will have a perfect heart. We'll have the heart of God. Okay, we will have the mind of Christ. I don't know about you, but the battle in my life is the battle of the mind. I have Jesus in my heart. I have Jesus in my life. 
But that battle every day of Satan throwing his fiery darts at us, folks, it will not happen in heaven. It is no temptation, no death, no curse. And the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and we shall serve Him. Oh, folks, uh, you know, I, I've heard some people just say, well, what are we going to do in heaven? I, <laughs> I remember when I was a youth minister, even one of the youth said, I think it might be boring there. I'm like, dude, it was a dude, okay? <laughs> it was a guy that said this. You, you just can't get in your mind what heaven is like because the, it, it will not be boring, folks. Number one, we will be worshiping. We will be worshiping. And I don't, I, I don't know about you, but I don't think our services are boring. We're singing about God. We're talking about God. We're talking about heaven. And if heaven doesn't fire you up, man, you need to dry your wood out. Your wood's wet is all I can say. Heaven is exciting, and it is a, an exciting place. It really is. And we need to understand that we will serve Him, whatever, you know, He wants to do. Because there, there, some people have a lot of questions about, you know, I, I've been asked this, are we going to be like flying to other planets? Are we going to be able to just go to other places like that? And I tell them what I know. I don't know. All right? I don't know. But that's what I'm kicking around in my head, not that, but questions that people ask me about heaven. I'm seriously thinking about doing uh, one sermon on that, and uh, hopefully God will allow me to do that. So, Matthew chapter 5, the blessings of heaven. And even with the blessings of heaven, we can have God's blessing here on earth. Matthew 5, verse 1, and seeing the multitudes, he, Jesus, went up on a mountain and was seated with his disciples and came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them. Listen to me, church. We are so blessed. We are a blessed church. We are a blessed people. And it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we know that poor in spirit is humility. You want a blessing in your life? We're talking about application here. You want a blessing? You humble yourself before God. You put others' needs before yourself. Blessed are those who mourn. Mourn. And again, no crying in heaven. But folks, when people mourn, we need to mourn with them. We need to undergird them. We need to encourage them. We need to pray for them for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek. There are people who think meek means weak. It does not mean that at all. It's power under control. Yeah, you might could take uh, you know, uh, control of the situation, but folks, we need to let God control situations in our lives. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Okay? You want to find righteousness? You get in God's Word. You study God's Word. You memorize God's Word, and you will see righteousness. For they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Folks, we ought to know this. We, we have mercy because of God. We have His grace in our life. And we need to show others mercy. Doesn't matter what they have done to us. Doesn't matter how our feelings are. We need to show mercy. Jesus showed mercy on those even there at the cross who nailed him to the cross. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. One of the things that's going to happen in heaven is, folks, and, and again, this is one thing we cannot comprehend right now. There'll be perfect peace. Man, can you imagine that? I don't know about you, but sometimes I lay in bed and 
man, I can't turn my mind off. Anybody else have that issue? I just can't turn it off. And it's not that I'm worrying or I, I don't feel like I'm worrying. I'm just simply saying that there's so many situations where there's heartache and there's pain. And sometimes it hurts me when I see other people hurt. Is what I'm trying to say. Man in heaven, there is no hurt. It is peace. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs are the kingdom of God. Church, I'm going to say it again. You better start getting ready. All right? It's going to happen. Christians are going to be persecuted like we've never been persecuted before. There's already signs of it. All right? There are already people that want to, you know, uh, you know voice their opinion about us as Christians and what we believe and what we do. And folks, I am telling you, the further it gets along, the more it's going to cost us. And folks, uh, you know, persecution, they persecuted Jesus. They persecuted him. So if we have Jesus in our heart, persecution's coming. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you for my name's sake. Look at this. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Folks, we can have the blessings of heaven. We are going to have the blessings of heaven. But we can be blessed here on earth, right here and now. And blessed also means happy. We can have the joy of the Lord in our lives if we... And remember what it's called, the Beatitudes. These are attitudes that we should have. Folks, this is Jesus' words. And I know it's hard sometimes... I know the world can be cruel. I know people can hurt. If you've went to church for over two years, you've probably been hurt by something. And we have to realize, folks, we are a child of the King, and we have so many blessings, but we as human beings tend to dwell on the negative part. There is nothing negative in heaven. The perfect place. Number two, the perfect light. The perfect light. Look at verse 4. Man, I mean, it's already good. It's getting gooder right here. All right? And they shall see his face. Oh, my goodness. The face of God. In human flesh, we cannot be and see the face of God. It is so holy. It is so righteous. I'm telling you, I feel like we would just disintegrate in the presence of God here on earth. But God in heaven, we can have a conversation with. Now you just say, am I going to have to wait in line for that? <laughs> no, because there's no sin in heaven. All right? There's a virtue that we have a problem with. There's a fruit that we have a problem with. And it's called patience. All right, can I get an amen? amen? We want it now. We want, we want to talk to God first. Folks, God's going to work all that out, okay? He's going to work all that out. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. We will be marked by God. And of course, now, you know, it's just crazy, you know, between the piercings and the tattoos. And, and, and folks, I understand it's your body. You do what you want with it. But I'm simply saying we will be identified in heaven. I want God's name on my forehead. There shall be no night there. You think about darkness. Darkness scares little kids. Dark alleys, dark places, darkness. Why? Because we associate that with evil. There will be no night there. Somebody asked me one time, well, how are we going to sleep? You're not going to sleep. Well, I'm going to be tired. No, you won't. I'd like to get that glorified body right now where I'm not tired. Amen. Amen. But we will have it in heaven. No more night. No more night. There, no need for lamp or light of the sun. 
Matter of fact, if you wanted to substitute something there, which I would never do, but I'm just saying, son, why? S-O-N. Jesus is there. God is there. Folks, you have not, I mean, we've had, you know, glimpses of glory in our lives. We've had invitations that have went on, and I have personally seen invitations go on for an hour and a half when J. Harold Smith was at Cameron Baptist Church in Lawton, Oklahoma. It was the most incredible scene. Seventy-two people got saved that day. And people just kept, kept coming and kept coming and kept coming. I remember finally the choir director looking at the choir back and said, sit down and sing. They were singing for so long. Folks, I am telling you, God gives light. God is going to light up heaven. His glory is going to be seen. We won't have to get sunglasses. We will have perfect sight. Can I get an amen on perfect sight? Huh? I, I look at some things and say, Lori, what does that say? <laughs> you know? Perfect sight. And they shall reign forever and ever. Oh, folks, we are reigning with God. We will have Jesus on our side. John 1. Look at John 1. John chapter 1, verse 1. And the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word. And you can plug in Jesus there. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life. Folks, when you get Jesus, you get life. You get eternal life. And the life was the light of men. The light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Oh, folks, there's darkness all around us. The Bible tells us in Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, that we are the light of the world. We are God's light. We need to share that light. We need to help others. We need to be that light. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light. Even they thought, they thought that John the Baptist, they thought he was Jesus. All right, they compared him to Elijah, but he wasn't. He tells us clearly here, the word says, no, I am not the light. I am not the Messiah. But he was so on fire with Jesus. Folks, what a compliment for someone to say, man, you act like Jesus. Are you the Messiah? He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness to that light. In our world, in our day, light is everything. For things to grow, it has to have light. And that was the true light which gives us light to every man coming into the world. God gives everyone a chance to be saved. God gives everyone enough light to trust Him by faith. Light is all around us. Jesus and God is all around us. His Word is all around us. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came into his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Folks, I am a child of the King. A child of the King. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. In John chapter 3, it speaks of uh, being born again. Born again literally means born from above. Oh, folks, I am telling you, we have the perfect light, and that light in heaven is God, and that light in heaven is Jesus. We need to share Jesus. We need to share the light with others around us us. Then the third thing, the perfect place, 
the perfect light and the perfect reminder. Look at verse 6. Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true. Where have we seen that before? We have seen Jesus called that earlier in, Revel in Revelation. He is faithful and true. His words, the Word of God, is faithful and true. Folks, I believe it cover to cover from Genesis to Revelation. It is the pure Gospel. It is God breathed. It was sent down to us. We have every solution to life in our homes. We tuck them under our arms. We carry them to church. Everything we need in life can be found in the Word of God. And Jesus is faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets and His angels to show His servants the things which must shortly take place. One of the things I've tried to do all through Revelations is not just look at Revelation, but to go back in the Old Testament and see the prophecies that God gave. You have to understand some of these were hundreds of year, years apart. Hundred, hundreds of years apart. But yet, they don't contradict one another. We have God's holy Word. We need to treat it holy. We need to love it. Folks, it's the greatest book that has ever been written. It is the only book that will change your life inside and out. It is God's holy word. Verse 7 is a change. Jesus' words, Behold, I am coming quickly. And He says it three times in these last verses in Revelation. What is He doing? He's giving us a warning. Three times He's saying, Wake up! What are you waiting for? As Steve said earlier, He could come today. I'm not trying to scare anyone. And really, if you're saved, you shouldn't be scared. You ought, I, I know me, I'm just thinking, you know, hey, I'll, I'll do something. Or, uh, I, I cut my grass for the first time uh, in 14 months not too long ago. And after I cut it, I thought, Lord, you can come now. E everything on my body hurts right now. <laughs> but I'm telling you, one thing is I thank God that I could cut my grass, folks. It is an answer to prayer. But His Word... His Word. Blessed is He who keeps the Word of this prophecy. Folks, we need to do more than just read it. We need to obey it. Obey God's Holy Word. Verse 8, now I, John, notice the switch. He's switching back and forth. Saw and heard these things. When I heard and I saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. And we realized early in Revelation, John did the same thing. And folks, I don't think it was John didn't know what was going on. I think John was so in the Spirit. He was so seeing things that no man has ever seen before. That when he started talking and he heard the words of Jesus, the first thing he thought of, i got to get on my knees. I've got to get on my knees. I, I have to worship Jesus. Folks, I believe we as Christians do not get on our knees enough. Folks, we worship a holy God. We worship the God and Creator of this universe. We worship the God who has given us salvation. We worship the God that is going to take care of us forever and ever and ever, and we need to worship Him. Verse 9, and He said to me, see that you do not do that. And again, I thought He was just caught up in heaven. I thought He was just doing. He didn't do it on purpose. It was just a reaction to what was going on in heaven. And I know, I've said this many times, folks. I've been asked, what are you going to do the first 60 seconds in heaven? I said, one is I'm going to shut my mouth. When I get in there, I'll go, my mouth is going, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. You cannot. I have not seen ear nothing. You haven't seen what we're going to see. 
For I'm your fellow servant and your brethren, the prophets, and those who keep the words of this book worship God. Oh, folks, we will worship God in heaven, but we need to worship God. Listen to me. Every day of our lives. When we go to our Bible, we can worship God. When we listen to Christian music, we can worship God. When we pray to ourselves or out loud, we can worship God. Folks, I've heard people say, well, I just don't want to pray from some. I'm afraid somebody might, you know, judge me. Folks, that's their problem, not yours. God's just asking you just to speak, just as we are talking. Just talk to God. Talk to God. Then it says, worship God. I jotted down 10 things, and there's a whole lot more than that. But in heaven, it will be a life of fellowship. It will be a life of rest. Man, I'm looking forward to that, aren't you? No? Okay. <laughs> It'll be a life of full knowledge. I will understand when I get there. And folks, these trials and tribulations that we're going through right now, folks, it'll be erased from your mind. It will be as if it never happened. It will be a life of holiness, a life of joy, a life of service, a life of abundance, a life of glory. We'll see the glory of God, a life of peace, and a life of worship. Folks, we will see the perfect place, the perfect light, and the perfect reminder. Now he says to me, now the last part is a warning. Verse 10 and verse 11 is a warning. And he said to me, do not seal the words of this prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. What is he saying? He's saying you need to share the book of Revelation. You need to let people know he's coming. You need to, you know, and, and I've heard several pastors say this you know i'm afraid to preach out of the book of revelation i'm afraid i'll mess it up and i'm not criticizing them i'm simply saying folks we miss things we need to preach all of god's word god will give us the holy spirit to help us as we teach and as we share the word of god the revelation it literally means to reveal something, folks. And we need to reveal the truth of God. Now look at verse 11. For who is unjust, let him be unjust. Who is filthy, let him be filthy still. Who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And who is holy, let him be holy still. What is he saying? He's saying, folks, you know, you, you have one more chance. You have one more chance. That's why this book was written. Even today, in this invitation, God is holding out His hand. God is telling you, come. Just come. Come to the altar. Come to Jesus Christ. Come get your life right with Him. Come to Him. Follow Him in baptism. If He's told you to join this church, Join the church, folks. Acts chapter 26. I want to give you an example of somebody who waited too long. He waited too long. Acts 26, and I close with this. And we know in verse 19 through 23, Paul gives his testimony, his personal testimony. And folks, we ought to be sharing our personal testimony with people around us. Now, verse 24, now as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, Paul, you are beside, your, uh, beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. He's saying, you're a nut, Paul. There is no way. You're talking about a guy that was born a virgin? You're talking about a guy that lived a perfect life? Folks, you have to believe that by faith. It's the gospel. It's the gospel. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but I speak the truth and reason. For the king before whom I speak freely knows these things. For I'm convinced that none of these things escapes his attention since this thing was not done in a corner. He said, hey, we witnessed these things. 
We witness these things. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuaded me to be a Christian. Listen, folks, when you die, your chances are over. I'm just telling you the truth. I'm just telling you the truth. You're not going to get a second chance. He's not, you won't stand before him in, in, in his, in, at the great white throne judgment and he'll say, hey, buddy, I'll give you one more chance. You have to do it now. You have to do it while you're alive. You have to do it. And it says, and Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. What was Paul saying? Y'all have got me in chains. I'm in prison. But I'm telling you, one day, these chains are going to be broke away. God is going to set me free. If you die without Christ, you will be in chains the rest of your life through all of eternity. Folks, it's real easy. It comes down to one or two things. Are we going to heaven as children of God or we, will we be separated from God forever and ever and ever? Father, thank You for this day. and God, I thank You for Your Word. God, Your Word is yes. It is right. It is amen. And God, if there's one person here, God, I believe with all my heart, someone is thinking about salvation today. And God, I pray that they would listen to the Holy Spirit. God, I pray that they would just uh, uh, just not, not have pride. God, I pray they wouldn't try to justify things. God, I pray that they would just come to Jesus. God, your invitation says come. And God, I pray that today could be their day of salvation. And there's probably Christians out there that we need, need to rededicate their life to Christ. They really haven't been living like He is coming. And He said He's coming quickly. So God, we as Christians, we have to do what we do now. Now is the day. So God, just speak to hearts. God, this is your church. This is your invitation. And God, I pray people would just obey the Holy Spirit. Thank you that we can read about heaven. Thank you that we will spend an eternity with you. So God, if there's something that you're speaking to our hearts about, I pray that we would obey the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, I pray these things. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?